Good afternoon and welcome to the February 2021 edition of Green Infrastructure, Climate and Cities, a monthly seminar focusing on the unique challenges that climate change poses for city and what we can do about it. My name is Franco Montalto and I'm a professor at Drexel's College of Engineering and one of the lead PIs on the Consortium for Climate Risks in the Urban Northeast, uh, which is a NOAA funded initiative that brings you uh, this seminar series today. This particular seminar today is the second in a three part mini series focusing on environmental justice. And in this series, we've invited environmental justice leaders to co present with academic partners to talk about the different ways that universities and community organizations can partner on this important topic. Last month, we focused on the PES refinery site in Philadelphia. Tonight, we'll focus on toxic air quality in North Brooklyn. And then the third segment of the series, which will occur later this fall, uh, will include speakers from Boston. I just want to mention we're also pleased to promote this event as the second CC Run seminar uh, to be held during what Drexel is calling Climate Year, a period during which we here at Drexel are, um, are focusing on the ability for universities to play a role in the climate action that we all need. Let me advance the slide. Okay, so for those of you who are joining us for the first time, CC Run began hosting this series in 2014. All of our seminars are live cast, recorded, and archived on the CC Run website. And we invite you to go to the CC Run website and look at any of the uh, previous um, versions of this seminar series. Um, for those of you who seek continuing education credits, we will give continuing education credits to you if you email us and uh, we can document your participation in the event. During the seminar, please use the Q&A box to submit questions. You can also upvote other questions and raise your hand uh, to ask a question orally, but re please reverse, re reserve the chat for comments only. We may not see anything you post in the chat uh, as part of the Q&A. Because our focus uh, is on environmental justice, we decided to include a reminder at the beginning of each of our events that the land that we in the Northeast US are inhabiting today is the historical homeland of the Lenape uh, Native Americans. And quoting the Lenape Center, due to centuries of colonialism perpetuated by genocide, forced displacement and systemic oppression, today the Lenape diaspora is dispersed throughout the US and Canada. We offer the simple acknowledgement as a small act of respect and honor, especially in view of the topic that we will be discussing tonight. So our focus tonight is environmental justice issues in New York City, specifically toxic air quality in North Brooklyn. And we have two, uh, two exciting speakers to present to you tonight. Masum Moitra is a community urban planner, designer, architect, and artist currently working as the director of El Puente's Green Light District. This is an initiative in holistic self-determination and self-development in the rapidly gentrifying areas of South Williamsburg and Bushwick in New York City. Ms. Moitra will talk about the Nuestro Aire, our campaign, and how El Puente balances the needs of environmental justice communities with the technical expertise that university partners have to offer, exploring specifically this tension between what data means to communities on the ground. Our second speaker is Dr. Ana Baptista, who's an assistant professor of professional practice and the associate director of the Tishman Environment and Design Center at the New School, also in New York City. Uh, professor Baptista's research and professional practice focuses on environmental and climate justice. She works directly with impacted communities and coalitions to support the advancement of community-led alternatives to achieve environmental justice. So Professor Baptista will join the conversation to discuss her role uh, in, in this partnership. So uh, with that, I will hand it over. I will stop sharing and hand it over to Masum. Thanks, Franco. Um, OK, I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see and hear me? Yes, looks great. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm so happy to hear 
be here with Anna Baptista, who El Puente works closely with and who you know I've worked close, closely with in the past and have a small history with. Um, and thank you for having us. Um, so I'm going to introduce El Puente a little bit before I start, because I know not everyone is familiar with the history and legacy of El Puente. Um, El Puente is a community human rights organization that was founded in 1982 um, by Luis Garden Acosta, Francis Lucena, and Gino Maldonado. Um, El Puente's mission as an organization is to nurture and inspire leaders for peace and justice. Um, and, and I was just telling our fellow organizers and speakers that no amount of words can describe um, the legacy and vision of El Puente um, as well as any of the founders can. Um, unfortunately, our uh, founder, Luis Garden Acosta, passed away in 2019, but they made a beautiful tribute video for uh, him. And I just wanted to share that because the vision of uh, what El Puente is about, but also what uh, you know, the Southside Williamsburg, Los Sures, um, and Bushwick are about uh, is also not something that I can explain with words. So um, I'm just going to share this small video with you. Um, and I hope that you get an idea of the context we are working in. What is it to live a courageous life? Committing yourself to move forward, regardless of anything, anyone that's trying to block you from promoting peace and justice. That's living a courageous life. So I think that um, it starts with a sense of identity and a real sense of what is right and what is wrong. Committed to a community the rest of the city had forgotten. The south side of Williamsburg in the 70s and 80s, a time when simply walking our streets was taking a risk of one's very life. When so many had given up on a people, Luis Cardena Costa refused to ignore what was happening. In a 12-month period between 1979 and 1980, 48 young people were assassinated as a result of the violence between gangs. Our streets looked like the bombed-out aftermath of a war. For Luis, every life mattered. He stepped out from the rubble and stepped up to the challenge of creating a better world together with his community. El Puente is directed by Luis Garden Acosta and his wife, Frances Lucerna. Our story begins at the community center El Puente, the bridge in Spanish. And like a bridge, El Puente has helped young people cross over to a safer environment from the battle zone that has become urban America. What we need is development. What we have to focus is on creating community, promoting love and caring, mastery, peace and justice. If we do that, we can, we can then solve our problems. His approach was different. Inspired by the belief that with love, anything is possible, he built a movement. This movement focused on nurturing and inspiring leaders for peace and justice. Luis's vision became a reality, just like he knew it would. Young people reach within themselves, join with adults, and begin to form the kind of humanity and the kind of cry that says, we can be better than this. We can rescue this earth. We can change our environment. That is what we're about. So um, you can see that El Puente has had a long legacy. Um, in July, we are going to turn 39 years old. Um, so, uh, and the work has been going on for even longer than that. Um, in terms of environmental justice, um, El Puente has been a, a pioneer and a leader in this work as well, especially in, um, in Brooklyn and in the South Side. Um, and some of the um, I, I won't outline everything because it's lo it's a long history, but uh, just some of the uh, wins that have happened 
has been uh, one of them was like founding the community alliance for the environment and um, uh, stopping the development of a legislative 55 story incinerator in Williamsburg. Um, and then Excuse also, me, Masum, I'm sorry, you have to uh, share your screen again. We're not oh, your slides. You can't sorry. see it. Thank you, Franco. Can you see it now? Yep, that's it. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, yeah, so apart from the uh, shutting down the 55 story incinerator, El Puente also had a big win uh, by limiting the activities of a radioactive and hazardous waste storage facility uh, located in Williamsburg called Radiac, and which was also a youth led uh, movement. So, there has been a legacy of uh, leading the movement, not just uh, through the power of young people's leadership, but also through the power of arts and culture. Um, El Ponte is also co-founder of the New York City's Environmental Justice Alliance, uh, which fights for waste equity, cleaner public transportation, green infrastructure, and more, um, and works in solidarity with EJ communities all across the city. Um, in terms of air quality in the 90s, El Puente reached out to 5,000 of its outside neighbors in a three-year asthma study that resulted in the first scientific peer-reviewed article written by a community organization ever published by the American Journal of Public Health, and Luis was one of the co-authors in that. Um, so that the, the issue of air quality has been around for decades, um, and the campaign that we're talking about right now um, started in um, started about two years back. It's going to be two years in July. Um, so the Green Light District, um, which is uh, an initiative that's a part of El Puente, also founded by uh, Luis Gardner Costa, is uh, like Frank has already said, is a holistic community development and sustainability initiative. Um, this initiative is rooted in uh, the values of self-determination, equity, and has a very holistic approach to understanding problems and solving them. Um, so uh, what El Puente doesn't do is just see environmental justice as an environmental justice issue. El Puente ties environmental justice to the issues of health and wellness, health and wellness to education, education to affordable living, arts and culture, and like sees uh, like even the approach when it comes to solutions is really taking into account how all of these complex connections uh, manifest in the community. Um, another, um, the, the green light district was started about 10 years back um, and it was started in, um, in, uh, in response to the rapid gentrification that was happen, happening in Williamsburg. Um, many of you might know that Williamsburg is probably one of the highest real estate, uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, land value, has some of the highest real estate values in the world. Um, and, uh, but it also has, uh, in terms of demographic, it has these corridors like Southside Williamsburg, which are low income, middle income, uh, Latinx and African-American communities. And these are the families that El Puente represents. Um, both in Southside Williamsburg and in Bushwick, which is also a very rapidly gentr gentrifying community. Um, so uh, the, the air quality study that we're doing is really um, using this green light district model. And, 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 and even though this framework was developed 10 years back, it's still really the way uh, to the future. Luis was a visionary. So he really saw um, how, how um, moving towards the future, we need to get out of our silos and really organize in a way where we connect issues and the way we respond to them. Um, so Nuestro Aire was uh, really responding to the connection between sustainability in terms of environmental justice and public health and connecting that to community development and anti-gentrification work and cultural preservation. Because as you know, the, um, the Latinx community in this uh, particular areas has reduced uh, dramatically uh, over the last 10 years or so. Um, and um, so in terms of um, where we are located, we are located um, in a very, in a, in a location that's actually uh, just a very, uh, the reason that there's such high air pollution is that that location is an intersection of a lot of transportation infrastructure. 
So there's the Williamsburg Bridge that starts there. There's the Brooklyn Queens Expressway that cuts through the community. And there's a bus depot close by. Um, and the, this whole, the residential neighborhoods are uh, the route for a lot of trucks that are going to waste transfer stations um, and other industrial infrastructure that's also around because we are close to the waterfront. Um, I've included this map that you can see, it's not a great map, but what you can see is that this, uh, the BQE is from the Moses era, and um, you can see how, the, uh, how this um, highway kind of cuts straight through the green spaces in the community. Already there are hardly any green spaces, there are very few green spaces, as you can see in this particular map. Um, the green spaces that are there have been brutally split through by the BQE and uh, the most vulnerable people in the community, which is kids and seniors who use the parks the most, are really uh, the people who are exposed more to the air pollution from the vehicles that are um, passing through here. Um, so, of course, like uh, it's not a coincidence that these are communities of color <laughs> through which it passes through and the parks um, are still being used by children and um, the elderly and adults and families. Um, there are also parks that are not um, well maintained. There are parks that um, are not just have toxic air, but are unusable in many different ways. Um, so definitely the campaign is not just for air quality, but also to how to mitigate the worst impacts of it uh, by increasing open, by advocating for open spaces, healthy open spaces, not just open spaces, um, and for community wellness. Uh, so you can also see a picture of the BQE cutting through here. Um, the effects of this kind of this level of air pollution that has gone unaddressed for decades, even after all the advocacy that El Puente has done with our partners, is that uh, the, the rates of asthma-related hospitalization for children and adults in Williamsburg and Bushwick are double those of Brooklyn and New York City. So um, it's not a good situation. and um, Actually, anyone you speak to, um, almost like every um, staff member we talk to, members we talk to, um, almost everyone has asthma and people kind of take it for granted that respiratory illness is a part of a life in the community, which is of course a part of systemic racism. And that's really, we should name it as it is. Um, and um, you can see that, um, Art has always been a big way for El Puente to raise awareness. The mural that you can see um, on the site was uh, have been made by the by Los Muralistas, who are like a group, a collective, in, an intergenerational collective um, at El Puente, and they respond to various issues and work with young people to develop these beautiful um, murals that actually um, give a sense of community, but also talk about uh, some serious issues. Um, we also know that. Um, could, uh, like COVID-19 hit us right in the middle of the campaign. Um, and we've been um, really working off this Harvard study that says that communities with higher air pollution were worst hit by the deadliest impacts of COVID-19. So we are really taking this opportunity in the campaign to say that you cannot ignore this anymore because COVID-19 has exposed the fact that um, the reason that it has hit communities of color the most, Latinx and African-American communities the most in New York City is because that these underlying issues were not addressed in a timely manner. Um, if, um, if these issues of asthma, if these issues of um, not having enough open spaces, not having enough air purifying or green infrastructure were addressed, it's possible that people could have, um, you know, uh, actually been more resilient in the face of a public health disaster like this. So in this context, um, our air, Nuestra Aire, um, uh, was kind of uh, started as a campaign. Um, and the campaign has like many different uh, strategies that we use. Um, citizen science has definitely been one of the, uh, one of um, the green light district and El Puente's uh, a, a part of the legacy that it's not, science is not just something that comes from institutions or based in laboratories, but it's something that comes from the people, that has to be led by people, that has to be owned by people, that has to be understood by people. So um, awareness raising campaigns were important because a lot of people on the street don't know how toxic the air is. 
So you talk to parents in the park, often people don't know that their children are breathing this. And that's the reason why the entire family has asthma. Um, then uh, air quality monitoring was a big part. I'll, I'll talk about, I'll show you some images about and talk about it in a bit. Community arts and cultural organizers is always a big part. And this is uh, led by local um, Latinx and African-American artists. And, um, you know, there's a whole network called Kadri, a very powerful group who, um, you know, develops creative strategies to counter, uh, counter these issues. Uh, there's also an advocacy and political education aspect because that's a big part of the work that we do. In uh, do, We do a lot of coalition building. We sit on a lot of tables and we make sure that um, not just are we working at a grassroots level, but also at a policy level. And then there's mitigation planning and design. And this is where we work with academic institutions like the New School and Pratt. And this is where our partnership with Anna really came in. Um, and hopefully Anna will talk about it a little more in detail. But, uh, you know, the way that we developed solutions uh, were not just through consultation with community members, but also very much in partnership with um, Anna and her class uh, and, and her classes uh, for two consecutive uh, years and with Pratt, who's also a very long time partner of El Puente. Um, so the foundation of the RR campaign is youth-led citizen science. Uh, there were 60 young people from uh, Williamsburg Leadership Center um, and from El Puente Academy High School who collected air quality data through mobile monitoring and counting trucks. We were partnering with Queen College, Queens College's Barry Commoner Center and the Department of Health to install a, a series of uh, stationary monitors. So it was a combination of these low-cost portable sensors called air beams uh, that could connect to phones and they were co-located with high quality sensors from uh, the city's uh, the community air monitoring system um, so we were mainly focusing on pm 2.5 because that's the smallest and most dangerous particulate uh, matter pollutant and though we wanted to get a sense of the neighborhood overall we uh, we focused on parks and schools um, we also worked with uh, in in uh, coordination and with support from New York City's Environmental Justice Alliance and the Hambinder Foundation as part of Nija's community air mapping project. Um, and we were supported by uh, the Department of Health, the Department of Environmental Conservation and funded through the New York uh, City's Community Trust. Um, so in December 2019, uh, we, they, the, internally the students kind of presented their research and, anal and, and analysis and also solutions to some of these problems, which was, you know, a great success. Um, and right now we are, uh, where we are in the process is that we are waiting for uh, a lot of this data to be analyzed. And I think that's, um, we are also partnering with um, Pratt and with a student from an MIT who's an air quality expert and who's helping us visualize, uh, visualize this data. And I think that's where one of our challenges has been, like it's been two years since we did this uh, collection, almost two years. And um, yet we are still to have um, uh, an analysis of the data and being able to pull out the powerful parts of it that we can use for advocacy um, and being able to visualize it and understand it in a way where we can actually share it with people in the parks and on the street and actually use it uh, the way data should be used because then otherwise it brings the question that why are we even collecting this data like what why, why are we more you know, and, and who, uh, and the question also came of who owns that data? Like, is it the DOH? Is it parks? Is it uh, the, our funders? Uh, but of course we came to the fact that it is the, the young people led the project. You know, it was El Puente's uh, members, it was the community and, and the data is of course, um, you know, owned by us in that sense. Um, but I think the question has still been that uh, we've, found challenges in um, actually being able to represent the data in a way that where it can actually be used as a tool uh, for advocacy. Um, so you can see that the, the kind of information we got was really showing us what the safest and the most polluted areas in the neighborhood are and the times of the day that are days that are most harmful, which is extremely useful information. But again, we have to find a way to, um, to actually um, use this as an instrument for, um, you know, protecting people from the worst impacts of air pollution at the worst times. 
Um, so uh, currently, so one thing that we found out, uh, like the one analysis piece of analysis that we did get was that um, everywhere in New York City, the air quality has become slightly better, but in uh, the South Side, the it's it's a lot uh, slower. The the improvement is a lot slower, which is of course very vague, and and it and it's very different from the lived experiences of people uh, who we work with, who we talk to, families who we live, uh, who who we work with, who faced like very uh, you know lots of problems during COVID nineteen especially. So what we are doing is we realize that just quantitative data analysis is not going to be enough because the additional canisters and the additional monitoring that are needed to get a more comprehensive picture, quantitative picture, very expensive, um, hard to access. And combining it with indoor pollution, it's actually quite challenging to get that full picture. And we decided that we should also focus on public health outcomes, you know, do, do surveys um, with our partners, um, and something that we're doing right now is conducting oral history interviews to capture a more comprehensive data set, um, especially by supplementing this quantitative data with uh, qualitative data and really hearing the lived experiences of people who have suffered from asthma all their lives. So we're talking to people from different generations who have different backgrounds and who have uh, faced the issues of living here in many different ways. So there was um, you'll, of course, we can share it with you whenever we are ready for it. But you know, uh, you you hear powerful stories about people whose um, mother, someone whose mother passed away um, because she had asthma all her life because she lived here, and uh, and she got uh, she passed away due to COVID because, of course, she was more vulnerable at that point. We hear from parents who are desperate for open spaces and they have to commute a long way uh, just to get to a decent park because there's not, not, no open space, no healthy open space to actually go to in that area. We hear from someone who's who's been, who struggled with asthma their whole life, whose grandchild also suffered from asthma, who's a teacher in a school. You have so many absences in school because of asthma. I mean, there are so many ways in this that this community's life has been impacted by, by this because this issue was not addressed in a timely manner and it continues to affect and especially with COVID I think the alarming uh, nature of this issue um, has definitely come to surface and uh, what we are saying is that this this is the moral imperative now like if this is ignored and there's no action taken uh, now after knowing all of this then, uh, then we cannot have said that we are addressing systemic racism in New York City in any way. Um, in 2016, we also led a pilot study of citizen science, uh, scientists to study air quality in parks called the Urban Lab for Open Spaces. And uh, that from that study, they found that the peak levels of air pollution at LaGuardia playground are dangerously high. And that's four to six times higher than peak levels recommended by national standards. And LaGuardia Park is a park right in front of El Puente, um, the playground. And I think I find it uh, quite this uh, this finding is quite shocking because recently I was in a uh, in a park seminar where I had put this question forward, and someone from Parks responded. Their official response was saying that all playgrounds in New York City are the same; they are maintained the same way, um, they are taken care of the same way, and and you know from people who have grown up all their lives in this community, um, we know that that's just not true. Um, something I want to talk about is that, and the reason I wanted to bring this up because you know the, I know that this is a uh, there will be in our audience a lot of people with a scientific background. Um, El Puente, I, I think, doesn't approach issues of public health and science um, in a very traditional way because a big part of uh, doing advocacy around it and um, you know collecting data and also developing solutions is through arts and culture. So you can see there was like a theater performance around, um, you know, to not just share the data that, that we were finding, but also to get input from the audience about um, what their solutions were. Uh, we, the whole year, all our programming was around air quality and environmental justice. Even the logo that you see of the project was developed by young people. Uh, once COVID hit, we, we um, trans, uh, transferred online. Um, and we shared our platform through a play 
that was done online. There's a puppet show so that people of all ages can engage. We also go to people where they are instead of expecting people to come to us for information. We go to parks, we go to, uh, we do street uh, campaigning. Uh, the, you can see the picture of a flash mob by young people that happened in one of the more gentrified parks to raise awareness about uh, this issue. Um, coalition building, you can see that we partner with people from um, government agencies, electeds, community-based organizations, academic institutions, environmental organizations. We are part of a lot of different coalitions and that is one of the, way, one of the strategies that Elfund has historically used and continues to use uh, in order to see results. Um, and we, of course, have a very strong relationship um, with you know, uh, all our local um, electeds as well so that we can see the impact of our work. Uh, you can see like we go to classrooms to talk about um, things. We, all, we also started a petition that has over um, 1300 signatures now. And, um, I'm, uh, and I know Corinne is going to drop the link for the petition in the chat where you can also see our report for the project if you need to know more. We also had a lot of community forums. Everything is bilingual because we know that language access is a big reason why this information and why data of any kind, uh, when you are based in an environmental justice community, why data is inaccessible because uh, often uh, language is not, um, you know, people, uh, the, the, uh, when we are releasing data, we are not sensitive to the fact that uh, the communities on the ground might not understand, um, might not uh, be able to understand, um, you know, the, the language, not just the English language data, but also the technocratic nature of data. Um, we also connect it not just to our local movement, but also to the climate justice movement as a whole. And, you know, our young people have been leaders in the climate strike that happened last year as well. Uh, we also have social media campaigns um, and we are working on getting better at that. And again, we are looking at our young members and our alumni for leadership in that. Um, so at the end of uh, phase one of the campaign last year, we released a five point platform. As I said, the Greenlight District is not just about um, understanding the problem and raising awareness around it. It's also about offering um, solutions so that when people ask that if politicians ask that, oh, okay, I understand the problem, but what do you want me to do about it? So that we can say that we already know what to do about it. We just want your help in implementing it. Um, and I think that's, uh, again, an approach that has worked very well for El Puente. And I think an approach through which, uh, I know Anna is going to talk about a little bit, but you know, Anna as an academic has always had that approach. Um, she has always asked us that, what do you need from us? You know, we are not going to give you the solution, but we'll help you research uh, what you don't uh, have capacity to research. We'll help you implement what you don't have capacity to implement. But the uh, ideas really came, were very much community led. So this platform is something again that um, Corin will hopefully drop in the chat. <clears throat> But I encourage you to explore it because each of them has a series of um, carefully kind of uh, honed in recommendations. Um, and it's about uh, breathing clean air, uh, having a public health emergency task force, health as, health as a human right, cultural organizing and greening for a safe future, which is about green infrastructure. Um, so this, uh, I mean, it's important the platform because everything that we're doing now in phase two of the project is really about implementing the recommendations and demands from that platform. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're doing it in many different ways in terms of health. Uh, we've uh, like, we have a, an amazing team um, of staff members and leaders at El Puente who have started a wellness hub uh, that's been tackling the issue of food security um, and mental health and, you know, working on food distribution projects. Um, we are also trying to advocate for um, shutting down a certain street uh, through open streets so that we can um, we can envision um, and start advocating for uh, the playground, uh, which is mostly concrete, very vulnerable to heat, very poorly designed to actually see that envision that as an urban forest. Um, we are we are also um, you know trying to join coalitions that are campaigning already for electrification of bus fleets. Um, so in many, and we are also, of course, like 
you know, trying to join bigger campaigns for parks uh, and trying to say that, you know, all parks along the BQE, including ours, need to have green walls. You know, we need to have, uh, we need to have some kind of mitigation, physical mitigation infrastructure that can, um, that can actually, um, you know, take care of this crisis that has been caused by tearing through communities of color, uh, by something like the BQE, tearing through parks in the community. That has to be addressed in some kind of a, a very concrete way. And that has been extremely difficult to advocate for. Um, we, have also, we are also exploring the possibility, and this was suggested by Anna actually, of um, seeing if we can um, work um, on like how uh, the South side can be declared as the first green zone of the East Coast because California has successfully done it. So we are, Anna has connected, uh, connected us to organizers in California who we can actually build with. And that's been amazing. So what's next is that we every part of the platform has a working group now with advisors from you know, residents to leaders, to academics, to government representatives. Um, we have like task forces for each of them. And there's a resiliency task force also to help us understand how to better deal with disasters in the future. Uh, we are hosting community forums, green table talks, uh, trying to connect the issue of air quality to other issues like climate change, food security, racism, et cetera, because people are constantly asking us those questions. And we feel like it's our role to address that. We're also doing grassroots direct action for park cleanups. We have a parents group that has taken leadership over um, organizing actions in parks. Uh, we are also working with our group of um, artists uh, called Kadre on these oral history interviews, on preparing public service announcements, um, walking tours, community theater. We're going to have an exhibition as well. Um, and uh, a key part is that we are going to do further research on each of these um, to uh, figure out a pathway to implementation and, and for policy change to happen. Um, and that's where uh, I'd like to pass it on to Anna because the new school and Pratt have been instrumental in helping us um, not just develop this five point platform, but um, also doing like asset mapping, uh, helping us understand the policy landscape, helping us, uh, us understand like what resources we need to tap into, what opportunities exist out there. And um, it's been normally uh, because I've worked uh, on the academic side as well. I'm part time faculty at the new school and at Parsons. Um, and I've been a part of a platform there that really focuses on, and Anna was actually on the board of that, and that really focuses on academic community relationships. And I'm very aware of how painful and unethical they often are and how much they build on our colonizer uh, relationship with academia. Uh, but um, uh, from whatever I've seen is that Anna is one of the few um, you know, academics along with Ron Schiffman and Juan Camilo Sario and Mercedes um, and, you know, the Pratt team who have also been incredible partners with El Puente. And all of these partnerships are very long-term partnerships, uh, but they're extremely productive as well. We actually use, uh, uh, and it's the information that students come up with, and we are building our campaign based on their recommendations. Um, and, you know, I feel like Anna takes a lot of responsibility over that and there's a lot of accountability and love in the relationship, which makes it really, um, you know, really effective and ethical. So I'll stop there and I'll pass it on to Anna and I hope I might have very much gone over time, but I'll just pass it on to her anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Masum. Uh, as we're passing it over to Anna, uh, I just wanted to point you to the Q&A. Somebody uh, provided an EPA resource uh, for free online visualization of data. And I just, one other, just to hit one question quickly, someone just asked for a clarification of what you meant by healthcare is a human right. I don't know if you want to just comment on that before we move on. Sure. Um, actually, uh, the the, Healthcare as a human right has been a part of El Puente's, um, you know, advocacy for a very long time because hospitals in the area um, haven't been, haven't had the most um, amount of resources. So there has been like inequitable distribution of, um, you know, resources to hospitals here, which has caused a lot of systemic healthcare problems. 
Um, there's also like language access issues because there's a lot of Spanish speaking folks here and a um, lot of undocumented folks who don't necessarily, who aren't able to necessarily access health resources. Um, there's also like, uh, we, are, we also very much about culturally um, relevant um, healthcare support um, and the fact that, um, you know, every, every community has a right to um, not just access healthcare, but also for that kind that healthcare to be something that is culturally adaptive to their needs, uh, not just in terms of language, but also in terms of being holistic. Um, so uh, there has been, like I'm saying, there has been a, a historical inequity in which the, in terms of health <laughs> and and the service that has been there in this in in these particular neighborhoods, and that's why we talk about health as a human right. The fact that people have the right to not be born with asthma. People have like they're small. Someone was telling us a story that they one year, uh, it, at three months, at three months, this teacher's grandchild got diagnosed with asthma, and all his life since then he is. Um, you know, dealt with it. His whole life has been, um, you know, shaped around the fact that that's that he suffers from this. And one of the reasons is because there hasn't been enough action taken around improving air quality here. So that's why we talk about health as a human right. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that covered it. All right. So I will step out of the way and hand it over to. Uh... Thank you. And yeah, what a what a treat to be able to be with Masum here um, to share a little bit of our experience um, of working together. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now in case I don't know if folks can see it. Uh, we only see half of a screen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. I think I've got it finally here. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm always humbled to, to be able to um, share the experience of working with such a powerful organization like El Puente that has such a deep lineage of, um, of EJ struggles and, and really um, a, a foundation in liberation struggles, you know, from the young lords, community health workers of the, of the 60s um, to Paulo Freire's um, you know, popular education movements in the global south. Um, you know, El Puente has really been um, a pioneer in um, bringing forth um, solutions that are community-centered, that are holistic, that are tied very intersectionally to the experiences of a diaspora um, in this, this really dense, interesting part of Brooklyn. So, um, you know, it's it's always humbling to be be in the in the presence of that. I mean, part of that legacy now in the work that we're doing with Masum, and I will just tell a little little entry point to how you know I got started working with El Puente. Of course, um, I work a lot in the environmental justice movement with organizations. I, I came out of the movement in working in Newark, New Jersey, um, on the ground with um, for over a decade with in my own community in Newark. In, um, and you know, always knew of El Puente and their work, uh, particularly around um, air quality and asthma. And in fact, you know, they were one of the first organizations that really um, led community-based participatory. They almost really created that whole field of community-based participatory research um, through their groundbreaking work, uh, looking at asthma prevalence and doing health um, surveys in their own community that informed um, a lot of research and, and science um, going forward. Um, I had a colleague at the New School back in 2015, 2016, uh, Ivan Ramirez, who wanted to work with El Puente because he, he saw the, the 1990s uh, research that had been done by community residents around asthma prevalence tied to transportation emissions, you know, people living right up against the Brooklyn and Queens Expressway. Um, and he and he wanted to go to the community and see if they wanted to reprise that study, you know, 20 years later, almost like a snapshot forward. What is what does asthma prevalence look like today, taking a similar approach? And and I said, oh, Ivan, that's that's interesting, but um, you know, you should really go ask El Puente what they wanted to. You know, it's 20 years later. Um, 
And, you know, the idea that um, the community needs to continue to make a case that they are impacted by asthma and air pollution may seem, you know, a little bit out of date. And in fact, you know, when Ivan approached El Puente at the time, they, they were heavily enmeshed in a campaign around green space and access to better parks, you know, as Mazum tells. And they said, you know, we don't really wanna go back 20 years to look at asthma problems. We wanna look forward and we wanna see how can we utilize the tools of citizen science and the best technology that's out there right now um, around air, local air monitoring to really try to make our point about the need, the dire need for better green space and, and really link it to advocacy that is relevant to the community today. Um, and so that, that happened back in 2016, 2017 and, and the young people um, at the Peace and Justice Academy uh, did a lot of training on GIS. They went out and did um, observational studies, field studies of park usage and traffic counts and, and took air quality data. So it was a very fruitful, um, continuation of the of the kind of work that um, I think El Puente has always led, and that's the key: is that El Puente is really in the lead in these partnerships. Um, and at the New School, I'm really lucky to be part of a community of practitioners um, that really center community-led uh, research and advocacy. Um, I help lead a center called the Tishman Environment and Design Center. And ourselves to uh, following the Jimenez principles for democratic organizing. Um, and those Jimenez principles commit us to being uh, really inclusive and respectful of uh, communities speaking for themselves, which is like a core principle of the environmental justice movement. Um, and so when we enter into relationships with communities like uh, community organizations like El Puente, we do so by trying to first abide by these principles um, and think about uh, the partnerships and relationships we're nurturing as long-term sustained partnerships um, that are that are based on a foundation of humility, you know, sort of setting aside some of the technocratic bias um, or institutional bias that comes with being in an academic institution, um, understanding that communities have lived experiences um, that uh, often uh, are much more well-informed than, than the ex experiences and perspectives we, we bring uh, on our own. And that it's really grounded in an ethic of care um, that my partnership with El Puente is, um, is grounded in this idea that I don't just care about one project, I'm not just there um, transactionally um, for publication purposes, but I'm really, um, genuinely interested in the um, you know the, the, the improvement and the and the goals and advancing the goals that El Puente has set for the community um, and that there's some level of accountability in that relationship as well um, and often uh, almost all of the work that we do at the Tishman Center is by invitation so we we don't go out prospecting for projects uh, we don't sit around the table and think about research agendas uh, independently. Uh, we really uh, try to work in collaborations where we are invited into partnerships and work that we do. Um, and that's true of the work that I think we did with El Puente based on, uh, you know, sort of uh, ongoing relationships that we had previously. Um, and, you know, we framed the work that we did with El Puente and we, we've done work also with other groups uh, that are listed here um, in Chicago and Newark um, and other, in other parts of the, the country. Um, and most of these critically engaged partnerships try to really value historically mar marginalized uh, knowledges, um, look to communities as agents of change, not just victims. Um, and so we really try to do really asset mapping with communities. Uh, we share our resources. So for example, if we have funding, we're transparent about what funding 
um, we have and, and try to share it equitably. And often we don't go for grants that compete with community partners. We let the community partners get the grants. And then um, if they want to invite us into doing work with them, they can pass through funding um, through their, their end. Um, and we develop uh, whatever research we're, or work we're doing together, we develop, deliver that, um, develop that collaboratively. Um, most of the work we've been doing in the last couple of years with El Puente has been through my environmental justice course. I lead a graduate course, usually about um, with about 20 graduate students from various disciplines, including the environmental policy program that I'm housed at in, at the new school. And, um, and most of that work is done really closely with um, Asum and her and her partners in El Puente, where they are basically giving really clear direction about what it is that they might need. And our students um, try to use their, their skills um, to collect data, policy research, best practices, um, things that will help uh, build a case and contribute to the recommendations and the implementation strategies that El Puente has set forth. So the idea is that the students are not themselves, you know, saying these are the recommendations because grad students are not in a position to come sort of out of context and deliver recommendations um, to an organization as politically astute and, and sophisticated as El Puente, uh, but it's really to provide additional capacity and support, you know, sort of legwork um, to the organization. And all of that policy research that, um, that has been done by my students is in the context of a broader commitment that I have made as a practitioner and that the Titian Center has made to participating in the Our Air project. So I sit on this and so that there's continuity and it's just not just one class, one semester that given people to sort of see that input all the way through um, the process that El Puente has in their timeline. So that's really important to not just do this work on a semester one-off basis. Um, and I just share these little tidbits as points of reflection. I share these with my colleagues at the new school often um, around things to think about when you're entering into partnerships with um, community organizations, environmental or justice groups. Um, and I, you know, some of these have helped me as, as I've done um, and tried to navigate the world between academia and movement uh, spaces and really thinking intentionally about the kinds of power we hold, both um, political, technical, formal and informal, um, and how we, we share that power and, and reveal it um, and work really deliberatively with our, our community partners. So that's, um, I'm, I'm hoping that these little things to consider are useful um, for all of you who are scientists and researchers embarking on community-based um, engaged uh, projects. And that's it, really. I'm gonna stop there and stop sharing so that we can maybe have a little bit of a back and forth conversation with Masoom. Thanks so much, and yeah, that was great. Um, maybe um, I'll just direct to you uh, two questions from the Q&A and then we can open it up for a broader conversation. So. Uh, the first question is, is about who, regarding your presentation in particular, who do you think needs the most convincing? Is it, is it, um, is it the academics themselves? Is it the government agencies that fund research? I'm, I'm sort of using a little poetic license to um, integrate in what I think this person is getting at. But who do you think needs the most convincing about uh, the, the sort of ability for universities to interact with environmental justice stakeholders in a constructive way? Oh, that's a good question. Who needs most convincing? Um, you know, uh, I, I often think that, you know, academic institutions are sometimes the hardest to move because, um, one second. Apologize for that. Um, but yeah, no, I think that academic institutions set up, you know, sort of uh, 
perverse incentives for both academics and students to act as free agents and to maximize the, you know, sort of extractive nature of, of partnerships and research because that's how, because those systems are set up to reward academics and students for a certain type of work. Um, and it's taken a long time for universities to realize that there's different ways to approach research and to reward different modes of knowledge production um, and to recognize different modes of knowledge production and learning. Um, so, you know, I think academic institutions, although that there's a growing awareness in, in the scholarship across different sectors that it's important, um, there's still not been significant reforms to the institution's incentive structures um, to shift fundamentally the way um, that research is, is done. Um, so, you know, I think those might be the, the, the toughest nuts to crack, you know, although there are scholar activists and, and institutions that are doing that work, they're usually not doing that. They're, they're usually not the norm. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and I, I think government institutions, it really depends, you know, um, it can vary quite a bit, especially depending on the administration and who's, who's leading those agencies. But yeah. So at, at the new school, do you feel that the, you know, as an assistant professor at the new school, do you feel that the, uh, the university uh, sort of rewards this kind of engaged community, community engaged research? Uh, or is there, especially in your, uh, in your particular, in the Tishman Institute? Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to say that I'm in, in sort of a, you know, a, a unique institution that, you know, I think does pay a lot of attention to different types of scholarship. I mean, I'm a professor of practice, so I'm not a tenure track professor. Um, so I do get, um, I, I do get, val you know, evaluated based on my, my practice and part of my practice is, you know, collaborative. Um, but nevertheless, we still have a lot of work to do. Even in really liberal, progressive institutions, there are a lot of good intentions, but maybe not good practices. You know, for example, you know, there are tons of studios that still happen at the new school where they send out students to do projects, you know, to do prospecting for, for projects um, and don't really train or teach the students how to do that in a manner that's respectful, that's, you know, not basically draining and, and um, extracting from community organizations. Um, and so there's still a lot of like training and practical work that has to go along with good intentions. So yeah, I mean, we're, we've still got work to do. <laughs> I'm assuming knows that well. <laughs> yeah, I can help answer that because I was co-directing the New School Collaboratory for you know, around two years, which was really focused on um, you know, creating a community practice among all the various kinds of scholars at the New School who partner with communities in different ways. And like Anna was saying, though, even though some, there are some best practices and some people who are really have long-term commitments, but there are definitely also people who are still you know, uh, focused on like, how can we solve an issue in Africa you know, while we are based at the new school after like two or three visits, you know, to, uh, but not just that, that's an extreme example. We also have, um, you know, uh, some people use community benefit agreements, some people use like the HIMES principles, like what Anna is saying, uh, but others do it in a much more unstructured way that are not necessarily grounded in, um, you know, the, the kind of principles that have been uh, developed uh, through community organizing. So there are a lot of approaches um, and I think you can see them all at the new school, the whole spectrum of it. And I can share some information about this um, in the chat. That's great. Um, and returning back to air quality, um, Patrick O'Neill asks, or his comment is that EPA, EPA and state agencies indicate that air quality has actually improved over the last 25 years but asthma has apparently significantly increased. So you know, does that mean that we're not measuring the right things or is there something else that we're missing? What's the discrepancy between the, that sort of EPA uh, data and what you're, what you're observing on the ground? 
I mean, that's after we uh, analyzed our data, that was definitely like, I, I think I mentioned it in my presentation as well. I mean, what the DOH did share is that generally the air quality and the entire city has improved, but in um, neighborhoods like ours, it's improved a lot less slowly. And uh, of, and of course, uh, part of the analysis was that, you know, measuring PM 2.5 is not enough. There's also black carbon, there's other kinds of particulate matter. Um, and also there's indoor pollution. Like they were saying that in schools, cafeterias are a big source of air pollution. So there are definitely um, other sources of air pollution in work here. And which is why we started also focusing on um, understanding the public um, health landscape right now. Uh, you know, what kind of respiratory illnesses and distress people are facing uh, to get a better uh, understanding of the situation because we didn't have the capacity to do this comprehensive um, kind of mapping. And I think we shouldn't let off the hook, <laughs> the BQE or these uh, infrastructure sources of pollution and the fact that, you know, there are, uh, and the truck routes being located in these areas because of the fact that the local, the very localized air monitoring studies that we did do through our citizen science project did show the most pollution in parks around the BQE, you know? So um, you can't deny that there is uh, an impact of these projects and there is uh, uh, an obligation of the city and the state <laughs> to actually respond to these, um, to the long-term impacts of these projects. So I would say, yes, it's improved, but you also cannot deny the fact that they remain toxic zones. And just because they're pockets, these communities are often pockets. They're like corridors. So you, you don't see in the, you know, in the census data, you don't always see uh, what the hyper local conditions are. Uh, but I think the uh, citizen science part of the project really helped um, understand that better so yeah so it, it sounds like the specific answer is that it depends where you look it may be that everything is going up but it's going up on average but if you look at in certain places their problems persist and so that yeah. might be the specific answer is to look where the problem is worse or has been worse yeah and i would also say that you're not epa is not measuring um, very localized, granular experience of air pollution. I mean, when you look at epidemiological longitudinal studies um, of personal exposure, um, you know, we had a study in Newark that um, had personal black carbon monitors on children 24 hours a day for 30, day, 30 to 60 days. And we saw that the personal exposure of those children as they walked to school along transit routes and while they're sitting in classrooms with windows open is you know was off the charts right in terms of black carbon and personal exposure to pm so we are not measuring um, very granular localized air pollution particularly in hot spots so we have a good understanding broadly of air air quality but we do not have a good sense of localized very localized air pollution and we we definitely don't have a good sense of the underlying susceptibility of populations experiencing multiple cumulative um, types of burdens, right? So they're experiencing, which is what lends itself to asthma prevalence, right? Where asthma prevalence has multiple um, exposure pathways. And so it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than, well, it, you know, everybody's getting better air quality. That actually speaks to the the ingrained nature of environmental injustice, right? That it's a lot, it's really built in, it's, it's literally built into our built environment. Um, so um, unless we're making really targeted investments in uh, air monitoring and air quality improvements, you're, you're probably not gonna see those trends. So I wanna move to a question um, by Elise Edgar Crow. She, she's asking a little bit more about how the Puente does its work and is inspired by, um, uh, I, I wasn't aware of this, but December 2020, South Park, London, a case where it's the first time that a cause of death is attributed to car traffic, air pollution. And the question is specifically, does El Puente pursue legal recourse as part of their advocacy work, or is it more on the sort of networking advocacy citizen science side? Yeah, thanks for that uh, question. Um, I actually 
when I saw your question, I quickly checked in with some of the people at El Ponte who have been there for like 40 years, because El Ponte is full of people who have been there since they were kids and are now the leaders of the organization, you know, so um, uh, actually, uh, El Ponte in Puerto Rico has taken legal action and definitely like I, uh, El Ponte doesn't have a one prong strategy where we just do it through arts and we just do it through schools or education. It's not like that. We do when it's required, we'll take legal recourse. When, it, when we have the capacity, when we're able to, we, um, you know, we drive policy change um, and all of that. Uh, what we do is a lot of the work we do as part of coalitions. Um, so in terms of air quality, we haven't yet taken legal recourse, but we were very inspired by this case that you're mentioning about the mother of this uh, little girl um, and that she was diagnosed for the first time. And, and, you know, that's something we really refer to. We have a lot of legal partners um, who, um, you know, who work with us on various issues, including housing. Um, so um, that's something we, uh, you know, we definitely want to explore as we move along through the campaign. Um, and, um, uh, you know, our deputy director, Asnat, was telling me that with RADIAC, um, you know, I talked about RADIAC, the nuclear waste facility, that as a part of a coalition, um, El Puente did take legal uh, recourse. And I can find out more information about that and share it with you if you're really interested in digging deep. Um, but yeah, so our strategy is not um, single faceted. <laughs> it's all of uh, many of these things that you mentioned uh, that are combined, uh, Franco, a bunch of all, all There's of a, yeah, yeah. So related question just on, on, are there statistics out there that relate the average number of vehicles per year in a zip code to the asthma cases? That was, I guess those kinds of statistics would be important if you were trying to sort of show that there was disproportionate, quantitatively show that there was disproportionately impacts in one place versus another. Do you happen to know that? Yeah, I mean, those studies, there are a lot of those studies that correlate traffic and proximity to traffic, you know, to highways or, you know, major traffic corridors to asthma prevalence, mortality, low birth weight, you know, lots of maternal outcomes. So there's, you know, tons of epidemiological, you know, um, you know, epidemiological studies um, and health studies that show those correlations. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why many environmental justice communities have turned away from doing a lot, spending a lot of resources and capacity to recreate the studies because the science the sort of has really affirmed that correlation. And so the next step is sort of to take the existing empirical knowledge that we know that, you know, this, 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 uh, these relationships and what can you do about them rather than, you know, you know, recreating them over and over again. Right. Um, so and another question for you, this is from a student, I, I presume from the new school, who is just asking, um, you know, what if you're a student in a class uh, that has not sort of focused on these issues um, and yet they're relevant to the topic of the class? How have students advocated for uh, sort of changes in the pedagogical strategy so that they can do through their class projects uh, the kind of work that's so needed and so meaningful. Yeah, and I invite Masoom to brainstorm here ideas because she herself was a student and also worked with a lot of different types of faculty. Um, you know, it's hard sometimes for students to raise these issues because of the power dynamics in the classroom as well, right? Where students, you know, may feel intimidated to raise these issues. Um, but I think the student, one way to do it is students can bring forth the resources that are available. So like at the new school, there's the collaboratory and the Tishman Center, and there are models within the institution that point to best practices um, that can be a resource um, and a reference point for, for the class and for the teacher. Um, there's also like academic advisors that can be brought in to work with faculty in the class um, to raise these issues. Um, so, you know, it's a it's sort of a, a delicate balance, but I think, you know, if I know one thing about the new school students is that they're not shy to, <laughs> you know, you know, call out these issues and bring them forth in conversations and really challenge um, the norms. And, and I think, um, you know, 
it's it's a learning process sometimes for, you know a lot of times the, the, the faculty have a lot to learn from the students too um, and the experiences that the students bring um, so I encourage students to um, you know sort of take that leap forward and make those suggestions and push back uh, when they see that you know there could be better ways to, to approach community engagement yeah I mean I, I definitely uh, add add to whatever I mean, agree with everything Anna said and I'd say that uh, I just shared the link for the new school collaboration you'll see like there's a whole um, database of projects where various kind of collaborations have been done so I think there are some examples to look to but with a critical eye because not all might be um, along the lines that uh, you know you find principled um, you know I feel like something I appreciate about El Puente is that they lay down uh, principles and they really ingrain that in every person who works here so that you know that all partnerships are always based on fundamental principles and I think academic classrooms need to start doing that need to establish sets of principles and then really or, or look at existing principles like the Himes principles or other principles of, uh, of you know this kind of collaboration that exists and then really follow those as guidelines um, as a student myself at the new school my way of doing it was I, I was a student organizer I was a co-chair of the social justice committee so a lot of it was doing it outside the classroom and organizing with other students who are equally frustrated by the limitations of academia when it comes to making to you know being able to work alongside communities also whenever we partnered with communities through the classroom I, I personally made sure that um, my partnership with that particular activist or community member was beyond the uh, beyond the scope of the classroom because one semester nothing ever happens in one semester so I would always keep in touch with um, any organization and make sure that I was able to uh, be of service in whatever way I could be even beyond the scope of whatever that classroom allowed and those relationships are still ongoing they are one of the most valued relationships in my life of my life and you know, I, like I also worked at Tishman Center as a research assistant. So all of it really comes back around. So uh, I would say that sometimes we have to, um, you know, if we are not happy with the way our, you know, our faculty members and our professors are um, engaging with community or not engaging with community, I think we have to take initiative ourselves and not depend on an institution that was founded on a legacy of um you know exploitation to really solve that issue and we have to uh, kind of go beyond that as students and uh, partner with each other and with the uh, folks that we want to work with one example i want to give of that is a student renters assembly that we organized at the new school as students um, so that uh, we can work with other students all over the city to address issues of gentrification so i feel like there are many ways to do it but um, yeah, lots to explore there. Yeah, and uh, those are great answers. And I just want to say to the new school student that at Drexel, um, <clears throat> we, the um, on a different issue on climate action, um, I mentioned at the, at the intro that this is climate year at Drexel, which was um, really a big advocacy uh, undertaking, going up to the highest levels of the administration of the university. And in those conversations, continuously, um, I heard mention to some uh, actions of the undergraduate student government, the Fossil Free Drexel and the Drexel Sierra Club who organized um, rallies over right before COVID on this topic. And you know, the, the administration and the faculty, they see that, they hear that, and it, it is um, critical in sort of mobilizing uh, change within a bureaucracy like a university. So. Just want to you know echo what's been said that how important it is for students to speak up and to really display what they want out of this institution that they've elected to or they've entrusted their education to um lisa hastings is asking a very specific question about industrial redevelopment corporations and collaborations with with them um i'm wondering um not exactly sure of the context here but i guess this is looking sort of more broadly, not just academia and university, but then getting bringing in the sort of development community, the business community. 
um, you know, how do, how do all these partners work together? And I'm assuming if you have, if you have any reflections, I know in Williamsburg, the amount of gentrification that has occurred, um, it's not been industrial redevelopment, it's been more housing residential redevelopment um, that's taken over industrial parcels um, and that and navigating those relationships with those development um, corporations. Um, she can speak to that. I mean, I, in Newark, we, you know, in community-based organizations, we're not, we're often in the position um, to oppose, not work with industrial redevelopment corps because um, their interests often collided. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that comes from, you know, the types of redevelopment that were being pursued, often dirty industries that caused greater pollution harms. Um, so I don't have a lot of good advice about how to interact with um, industrial redevelopment core, although in New York City, there's a lot more emphasis on maintaining the industrial corridors to sort of fight the impacts of gentrification in, in a way to protect and preserve a jobs base and just improve um, the pollution prevention practices of the existing industrial corridor and, and push back gentrification from the residential sector. But I don't know if Masoom, if you have any reflections on working with the development corps in the Williamsburg area. Yeah, it's definitely like a complicated um, relationship because a lot of people will say that, you know, um, if you don't work with them, then they, it's going to happen anyway, uh, that kind of uh, a development, but it's, it's going to possibly wipe out <laughs> even the whatever little of the community uh, is left. So a lot of, you know, strategic action and partnerships have been made, I think, over the, over the years in many different, in many different ways. Um, which something that we are pitching right now, that's part of our recommendations from the Nuestra Aire platform as a green development fund, um, actually creating a pool of, um, pool of um, funds that uh, where a percentage of, um, you know, uh, profits uh, have to be have to go into community control um, fund through which you know we are able to pursue um, ideas like community land trusts and 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 be able to uh, you know uh, open public plazas and steward them and be able to you know afford the staff uh, staffing to have open streets and uh, and you know to be able to uh, take the cleaning and the maintenance of parks into our own hands being able to fund green walls and mitigation in infrastructure. So we definitely um, are exploring ways to do that. We are also looking at NOAC as a case study. Um, like I said, we have been talking to organizers in California to see how they've, uh, you know, proceeded around it and, and um, you know, um, getting kind of, kind of trying to see like, um, you know, what kind of, how, how can these accountability mechanisms work uh, in the best possible way? But uh, yeah, that's pretty much where we are. Now, are you also talking about developers or are you mostly talking about like industries? Uh, Lisa? Well, the question is, it talks about industrial redevelopment corporations. So I'm not sure, but um, there's certainly a tension there with, with job creation, which is also economic development need of a community. And then the impacts of, of, that, of that industry on the environment. Yeah. Yeah, there, it's very complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a, you mentioned, uh, Anna, the, uh, the collaboratory at the New School. And I just think that for some of our Drexel audience, it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about how that collaboratory works because there's um, something brewing here on campus that's similar. And um, so there's a lot of, there's a growing discussion about how to, uh, appropriately collaborate and, and how a collaboratory would work with what goals and stuff. So I wonder if there's anything you can just tell us about how that model works, how the university, uh, I mean, you mentioned principles so far, but I'm um, so beyond the principles, how, what's the mechanics of it? How, how does it work? I'm assuming probably be better, better positioned to answer this question actually, because she worked uh, for the collaboratory for a while. Um, but, you know, the idea behind the collaboratory was 
you know, not only to share best practices and, you know, to create a community of practitioners and, you know, academics that had um, an interest and some experience in, in um, collaborative work, community engaged, publicly engaged work. And it spanned a, quite a spectrum. So like from scholar activism to like practitioner based models, you know, there's, you know, really a large spectrum of collaborative work. Um, but then also to kind of try to understand like the institutional barriers and opportunities for reform that would enable better practices of collaboration um, and, and uh, you know, help us to live up to our, you know, our best aspirations and ideals. And when we talk about the new school as a place of like, you know, progressive ideals and, you know, radically engaged scholars, but, um, but you know, putting that into practice, meaning how does that um, get looked at in your review process as a faculty member? How does that show up in your curriculum? Like, how does it get? How are you accountable to that collab? You know, those collaborations, and then how do you spread that institutionally across? You know, because the collaboratory was sort of a the party of the willing, sort of the <laughs> the folks that were sort of already had some some focus and, and interest in that. But then, you know, the question is, how do you bring that forth across the entire institution through curriculum pedagogy? Um, and so there were, I think, a lot of recommendations that came out of the collaboratory that are still ongoing projects um, of the institution. But I don't assume that I don't know if you can pick up, you know, where where the collaboratory might might be headed. Sure, yeah. I was one of the co-directors along with Michelle Kahana of the collaboratory. And um, basically the collaboratory had, I think three different uh, three different ways in which um, uh, you know we were organizing. One was building learning communities um, through like capacity building workshops, think tanks. Um, and we were also doing an annual symposium where we were you know, gathering and you can see the report from the first symposium online, which puts forward like all the recommendations that came forward, but it was pulling together um, faculty from all across the city, uh, institutions all across the city. Um, and eventually the second one was almost, it wasn't comprehensively the Northeast region, but we tried to go beyond New York City, um, definitely to faculty in Connecticut and elsewhere. Um, and, uh, uh, that symposium was very um, useful in developing and in, in staying tuned with what folks are doing on the field and how best they're engaging um, with communities and what the evolving best practices are. So I would really um, refer you to that report. Um, and another part of the collaboratory, and that's how the collaboratory started, was showcasing work because a lot of this work was very ad hoc, you know, like people were just randomly doing faculty were using their own strategies own relation in, in a very effective way sometimes uh, but it was very ad hoc there was no comprehensive um, you know set of tools or any kind of agreements or any kind of um, you know foundational ethics or any anything that people were following really um, in the way that you know re, in the way that research um, is like monitored and you know uh, there's accountability around it that didn't, those mechanisms didn't really exist around this kind of work. Um, so we were also, uh, we had a digital platform. That's what the website essentially is to showcase work, but also to provide, um, you know, uh, places where you could write and uh, write about this work. So scholars could, with their partners, be able to produce knowledge in a different way, you know, being able to write blogs, being able to keep con continuously through a 10 year project document parts of their project and use the collaboratory as the platform to, um, to you know, uh, log in and uh, stay accountable to their partners. Um, and to of course share with students what best practices are. Um, we've also, this hasn't happened because our funding got cut <laughs> after right when COVID hit, um, but co-producing knowledge was something I was very passionate about, about going, um, you know, creating curriculum, that, that did happen. We did get a grant and through like Cynthia Lawson, Evan Oza and partnership with other faculty members, the community engagement 101 curriculum was prepared through a grant. Um, there, there's also, uh, you know, we've also, there, there was also re-granting <laughs> to faculty members. So I think there were uh, seven to 10 faculty members who were 
provided a pool of money specifically do, to do community engaged work. Um, and we were also thinking about an e-journal that would specifically be about how partners can produce scholarship along with these faculty members. So it's not just writing a journal, publishing a journal piece saying that we are working in the community, but actually co-writing with uh, and being able to fund co-writing uh, projects with with uh, you know community organization partners. Just the way Luis De wrote the first um, you know this asthma article. So I think El Puente was ahead of times, but that's pretty much where the collaboratory. Um, you know, uh, wants to head, I think. Uh, but unfortunately, we ran out of funding, though I know that it's being continued in some very low key form, but this was the vision for it. Thank you for that. That's very interesting to us because, you know, and, and I, I will say just from my own experience, oftentimes what happens is faculty person has um, a certain level of expertise in a certain area and then sees a funding opportunity for research and the funding opportunity encourages stakeholder engagement. And then the faculty person is running around trying to find a person, a group, a community with which to work. And that's the opposite of, you know, sort of the, the method that, you know, th that you're talking about. So these models for collaboration that allow for sufficient lead time so that the research plan that is put into the proposal that is ultimately funded is driven very directly by collaboration between impacted and you know the scientific community. So so that's it, it's you know it's very it's a very tough nut to crack within the sort of structure that research happens. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, this. absolutely. And you know, making sure that our partners have accessible to the resources that our students have access to, right? That they are able to access the libraries, the computers, etc. That we were even talking with uh, Mary Watson, the dean, uh, that we should you know have a way to provide credits if we are collaborating with young people at El Puente. Why shouldn't these young people have access to the same resources that the students who are partnering with them have access to? So yeah, definitely. Sometimes our even our buildings are not accessible by our own partners, even though they are enhancing our education. They are actually co-faculty. So that's something I, uh, you know I, I really wanted to do through the symposium, which is think of our partners as co-teachers, co-professors, instead of thinking of them as partners necessarily. Yep. Um, so Lista is asking a question about um, your experience in communities that see greening as gentrification and thus turn down, um, for example, trees. And I know that the research on whether trees improve air quality is sort of confusing and perhaps not clear. But um, but but how do you deal with that? That that, that this sort of juxtaposition between some things that are viewed by many as environmental improvements, you know, are also, of course, the force behind gentrification. So, how does that? I guess this is probably directed more to El Puente. How how do you how do you navigate that? Yeah, I definitely want to take the opportunity to bust the myth that um, you know communities do not want uh, communities of color, especially, do not want investment simply because of gentrification. What people want is investment with accountability, which is possible. It's not uh, like it's uh, so people know, have you ever heard anyone say that they don't want trees on their block? <laughs> That's, uh, I, and of course the fear of gentrification is extremely real. And we, we think about it, especially because, you know, my background is in community planning. So um, we think about it a lot, like right now, for example, one of the infrastructure solutions, the big infrastructure solutions to counter this air quality issue has been this project called BQ Green that was, uh, that was proposed like 15, I think around 15 years back by Diana Reyna. And, um, and, you know, El Puente has been part of the team advocating for it. But in and and that strategy was a very comprehensive strategy that connected green infrastructure projects to community centers, to housing, to cultural preservation, and all of that. But in 15 years, a, a lot has changed. So now we are rethinking again what kind of safeguards can we create within the community 
to stabilize rent, to create pathways to home ownership, to make sure we think about community land trust when we are thinking about a green infrastructure project of that scale. Because obviously, like if we don't think of that, then the project that is going to um, improve that particular neighborhood would also gentrify. And that has been the case for um, Williamsburg and Bushwick because you know when El Puente first came, property value was hardly anything in both places. Like you could buy properties for a dollar or something. Um, but uh, of course, like the work that El Puente has done has improved the community and um, also uh, influenced the real estate costs. And, and, and unfortunately, the community that worked so hard to make it better has not able to has not been able to stay. So everything moving forward, but however, we are still we still continue to advocate for the parks to be urban forests, for green walls to be added. We do tree planting programs ourselves uh, because of the fact that uh, and park cleanings ourselves because of the fact that we cannot look at green infrastructure as an isolated um, phenomenon, you know, and that's why the framework of the green light district is so important. It has to be. Um, we have to advocate for it uh, for you know, better uh, and greener spaces in relationship with um, housing advocacy, in relationship with, um, you know, rent uh, control, in relationship with anti-eviction campaigns. Um, so it cannot happen in isolation. We cannot just think about green infrastructure. And I hope that answers the question a little bit. Great. Um we only have a few minutes left. I don't see any more questions. I think maybe before I ask you each to maybe just leave us with your your final thoughts, uh, I just want to ask a very specific question about citizen science because I've been in some very interesting conversations recently about uh, paying citizen scientists and whether um, you know uh, how how that works. If it just especially to the extent that the citizen science is a form of stewardship, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of a form of caring for the community. And there's been a very uh, sort of an interesting discussion that I've been in with various community groups about, on the one hand, people need money and you want them to help you get this really important information and why not compensate people to help? Uh, on the other hand, um, that sort of sets up a precedent that uh, stewardship is something that you do if you get money for it, otherwise you don't do it. And I just wonder, since you're so actively involved in citizen science, how you how you navigate that? If you you pay your citizen scientists, if you if you can if you can, or if you have a, a position one way or the other. Yeah, um, I'm sure Anna has other examples of citizen science, but I can say that El Puente doesn't exactly work in that transactional way of the money and citizen science thing because. Again, a lot of the citizen science we do are youth led and there are members in programs in El Puente. And you know, the, the whole uh, El Puente's primary mission is to nurture leaders um, and, and youth leadership is a big part of it. And of course there will be stipends involved, et cetera, but these young leaders are very much leaders in their community. <laughs> you know, they care about the environment. They care about what's going to happen. They care about their families being displaced. They care about, uh, they care that there are no trees <laughs> in their community. They care that their parks are not safe. And, and these leaders, you know, are, are right now, they're all set to be, to stand in, in, uh, in elect, in, you know, they want to run for city council office. They want to run for assembly women positions, these are, uh, these are young people who really have a stake in the community. And that's because El Puente has a particular, um, you know, a way of building that, um, building that sense of care in young people. Uh, and, and that's connected with their own liberation, you know, how liberation can come through caring for your community through stewardship. So it's about liberation. It's not about the money. <laughs> At a, uh, like of course like you have to fairly stipend and that we uh, we do um but uh, it's not that's not the reason why our citizen scientists are doing the work they're doing in fact they they are also extremely um active in in giving in brainstorming around solutions there were young people who created ideas for air filtration pockets etc so they're not just doing the work and goodbye, you know, they're, they're uh, engaged year after year on the issue. 
uh, many a times they become staff members at El Puente and continue the work as organizers and as leaders in the El Puente community. And that's often happened with the young people who have done this work. So I would say that that's El Puente's approach, but um, yeah, maybe Anna, you have an idea about how- Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, if you're a community-based organization that has a mission around organizing, um, your approach to citizen science and to working with youth leadership is different than say a group of scientists or researchers or academic partners who've got a grant and they want, they need partners or they want partners in the community. Now in that grant, and I've seen a million cases of this, I've been a, a victim of some of these <laughs> partnerships where the grant will include, you know, you know, stipends for the research assistants and grad students and PhD doctoral fellows and the faculty time, but zero for the community organization. Or if it goes to the community organization, it's for food or, you know, uh, you know, a meeting. And I feel like that's very disrespectful to the community because ultimately you are, your compensation is a form of, you know, of recognition and accountability, um, you know, and, and I believe very much so that if you are not adequately valuing your partners and sharing in that funding and that distribution, if, if nobody has funding and everybody's caring for the earth, then that's great. But if you're part of a project that has funding and, and deliverables attached to that work, then that's part of a project that needs to be shared and it needs to be shared in a, in a fair manner. Um, and, and it's not, you know, and oftentimes the share of the funding that goes to community organizations is a fraction of what's going to the academic institutions, even though the knowledge that's produced um, and the relevancy of the work is completely tied to that partnership and that, and that, and that organization's labor. And that is real, I want, you know, I just want to end, end on this because it really burns me up inside <laughs> is that there's a real, um, it's, it's not just stewardship. This is not about stewardship. You heard Masum say the word liberation. It's tied to a practice and, and the valuing of labor and a legacy of work and knowledge that has been extracted from these communities. And when you enter into these grants um, and you have these partnerships, you need to, you know, give your part in that, in that um, reparative project. So I definitely think you need to be paying people for their time and their effort and their labor. Yes. Yeah, it's a very interesting dis sort of dis distinction you made between, so two different types of citizen science, right? It's one that's sort of grassroots, homegrown, unfunded citizen science, which of course you don't expect to be compensated because there's nothing to compensate with. But on the other hand, um, you know, when there is a funding source a a around collecting data that citizens are the best people to collect, you know, then, you know, it, it gets really, and that's been sort of my, my position in a lot of these discussions is that it's, um, you know, you, on the one hand, the same people who are activists for environmental justice are activists for a living wage, for example. So yeah, absolutely. Some point, right? <laughs> so if it's work, it should be compensated and, um, but, but, and but yeah. Sorry, Franca, I just wanted to say that yeah. we do, I mean, I think I mentioned that, but uh, whenever, like, we do stipend our young people as well, it's just not the, it's not the driving force for them to do that work. That's, that's the point I was trying to make. But. Yes, yeah, I, I, I get it. That, that's clear. Um, well, thanks to both of you. This has been, uh, this has been an amazing session. Uh, really appreciate all of the knowledge that you've shared with us. Um, if either of you want to make sort of like a final closing set of remarks, we have about four or five minutes. Um, I just wanted to respond to a chat. Um, I think a couple of people uh, commented saying that there are maps and graphics that are now available about this data on a bunch, on, on a lot of different websites. And that is true. Um, but I would say as an urban planner, I feel like uh, many of these systems of representation are also based, um, you know, in um, systems of white supremacy, I'm going to say, because, um, you know, maps, the way we design our maps, the way we um, share them, the way we, even graphics sometimes, uh, the way that, and, and I'm, I'm not just talking about language access, I'm also talking about the aesthetic, I'm a designer as well, you know, so, um, 
they are not they are not uh, images that are accessible uh, in many different ways or culturally adaptive so what i'd like to see is that when people collect data like this um, or even when governments do it i would like to see them come up with popular education tools you know come up with zines that can be used in classrooms like remembering that you know a lot of this leadership and action is going to come from young people like how do how are seniors going to understand this you know how are adults from various communities going to understand this information so i think that it's great that there is graphic representation and maps that are available more freely now than ever before but i think we have to keep pushing ourselves um as designers as planners um and really explore popular education tools and really educate uh, explore like culturally accessible tools for sharing data um that don't stop at <laughs> you know the kinds that we find on these websites so thanks so much yeah, thanks thanks for making that point and i i just see that you had texted me earlier and i, I didn't see your your uh, your text uh any closing statement from you anna I think Masoom closed it out beautifully, and it was uh, a pleasure to have this uh, opportunity to be with her and share this space with her and, and reflect on some of our, our work together. So thank you for the Thank invitation. you so much. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, yeah, you all are amazing organizers, I have to say. Very impressively organized. Thank you. Well, thank you. Me. Yeah, we rely on it. We're nothing without the speaker. So thank you for sharing all your insights with us. And to all of you, um, please join us the first Wednesday of every month. So we'll see you in March. Hopefully no more snow. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.